thank you guys. We thank you for being here. And once again, uh, we have a, a tremendous number of our brethren from, uh, from Hamilton that are here. And we are thankful for that. We're going to uh, finish out uh, our Vacation Bible School uh, in a very good way. Uh, we are thankful for, uh, for Ted and the job that he's done for us in teaching our adult class this week. And also Ryan uh, teaching the teens. And has done a great job, and, uh, and I'm thankful for all of the work, especially for all of our ladies uh, that put in many, many, many hours of preparatory work and then the work during the week uh, to make this uh, to make this a great week for us. And we are we are so thankful uh, that uh, we're able to have this, and we're thankful that you are here uh, with us. Um, We'll go ahead and we'll sing a few songs before we uh, dismiss to our classes. And so, uh, I, I always sing Jesus Loves Me. It's my favorite song, so I always start with that. So if you wonder why we sing it first every night, favorite song. And I'm a song leader, so I get to pick. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so.
This little Christian light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little Christian light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little Christian light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine all the time. Let it shine. Hide it under a bushel. No! I'm gonna let it shine. Hide it under a bushel. No! I'm gonna let it shine. Hide it under a bushel. No!
glasses. Okay. We're still recording, maybe just not streaming. All right, let's get our crater roll out. Tiptoe, tiptoe in God's house. Tiptoe, tiptoe like a mouse. Tiptoe, tiptoe in God's house. Tiptoe very softly. Tiptoe, tiptoe in God's house. Tiptoe, tiptoe like a mouse. Tiptoe, tiptoe in God's house. Tiptoe very softly. Tiptoe, tiptoe in God's house. Tiptoe, tiptoe like a mouse. Tiptoe, tiptoe in God's house. Tiptoe very softly. Tiptoe, tiptoe in God's house. Tiptoe, tiptoe like a mouse. Tiptoe, tiptoe in God's house. Tiptoe very softly. Tiptoe, tiptoe in God's house. Tiptoe, tiptoe like a mouse.
And, and my question is, why would Matthew, who was an eyewitness, have to rely on Mark? Uh, and I just don't think that holds water, but I do know that a lot of people believe they had to teach that. Let's talk for just a moment about Capernaum, because that's where this is going to take place. Capernaum is one of those cities up in the Sea of Galilee. Because water was so essential, a lot of towns built up around the Sea of Galilee. Now, the Sea of Galilee is not really all that big. It's only eight miles wide and about 13 miles of long. It's kind of shaped like a heart. So it's the longest point. It's about 13 miles, except in, in rainy season, it sometimes can stretch up to uh, 15 miles. In fact, uh, Smith Lake has a lot more uh, water and uh, surface in it than the Sea of Galilee. Uh, and the Sea of Galilee was called different things according to where you live. And the Gentiles would often call it the Lake of Gennesaret. And that probably was a better uh, description. But the Sea of Galilee, and I know several of you have been there, but the Sea of Galilee was uh, kind of in a valley. And to the north, there's a mountainous range on each side and a valley that comes between. Now, the water is usually choppy on the Sea of Galilee, but when that wind whips down through uh, the valley, across it, it can become a, a terrible storm. I've never seen a storm on the Sea of Galilee. Uh, when I was there, we had a worship service on Sunday night on a boat on the Sea of Galilee, and uh, the water was choppy, almost like it would be out in the ocean, but uh, we didn't see a storm. A good friend of mine, uh, years ago, Brother Marlon Connolly, that lived in Nashville, he had, uh, on his 18th trip, uh, carrying groups to the Bible lands, he was out there in a terrible storm was on the Sea of Galilee. And he was thrilled because he wanted to see the storm on the Sea of Galilee. But everybody else was scared to death. And uh, so when those winds sweep across it, but uh, Capernaum is a beautiful little place. Uh, it's uh, the ruins of the synagogue are still there today. It's not the synagogue that Jesus would have walked in. But when you go in the back um, and you look over to the side, there's a crack, a big crack in the floor and a chunk of it is missing. And you can look down through that and see the floor of the original synagogue that was there. And that's the one that Jesus would have walked on. Capernaum uh, is a beautiful place. Uh, there are a lot of ruins of houses. And one of those houses, and we can't prove this, but in the uh, basement of that house, written, not in the basement, but the foundation of that house, is written in Aramaic, this was Peter's house. Uh, and it was written uh, supposedly by Christians. So tour guides, of course, they'll say, for a dollar, I'll show you. I'll show you Peter's house. Everything's a dollar. But, uh, uh, but you know, it's, it's, it's close to the synagogue. And so it is very possible. After Jesus was rejected twice in Nazareth, he made his home in Capernaum. And he lived with uh, Peter and uh, Peter's family in, in this house at Lydda. So with that little bit of background, let's look at Mark chapter uh, 2 and verse 1. And uh, look at question number one. Tell what was being noised in Capernaum after Jesus entered the city. What was being told all around the city? Well, he was, he was there. He was in the house. And so that was significant to them. Now, why would that be significant that Jesus was there? Yes, that's exactly right, Dr. Kirk. Um, that way, uh, people would come to be healed. And that's exactly what's going to happen. When it's noise that he's in the house, people are going to gather there. Verse 2, the straightway when many gathered together, insomuch there was no room to receive them, no, not so much as about the door, and he preached the word unto them. Uh, I've been to uh, a few uh, church buildings where there were uh, not room to get in. Uh, I remember when I was a kid going one time to a place and the windows were open because we didn't have air conditioning and people were out in the yard 
listening. I wanted to sit in the window, but the older men sat there so they could spit back out the window, I think. But anyway, um, when we were students at Free Harmon, uh, we sometimes on Wednesday nights would go to Estes, the church, and uh, they would, uh, deacons would be standing out in the parking lot waiting for the way. So there's no more room, there's no more place to sit, uh, there's no place to park, please go somewhere else. And we don't have that problem at Estes. Uh, our building sits 1,200, and we've got about a thousand seats available if anybody wants to, uh, you know. So we, we don't turn them away, but a few places they were. The thing about being at the uh, house, and it's so packed that people could not even get to the door. So, uh, what did they uh, look at? Question number four is based on Mark two and verse three. Explain what the four friends were doing when they approached the house where Jesus was preaching. What were they doing? Yeah, they were bringing one who's sick of the pulse. Uh, Dr. Kerr, uh, will you tell us a little bit about that? Lame. Sir? He's lame. Yes, he's lame. He and had polio. Okay. Uh, I remember once before hearing you say that probably he had polio. And so here he was, uh, unable to walk. And, uh, you know, here, here this individual, he, he was uh, helpless as far as getting to the Lord. And so he needed help. Now, I think about how these four friends were really, really uh, being kind. I mean, uh, do you know who would be carrying you on a, on a pallet or on a bed? If you had polio, if you were had palsy, name the four. Think about the four people that he carried, with you. and uh, that that those were true friends. And so think about that. Look look at uh, verse three. Uh, when they and they came come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. But here's the problem. Uh, Examine the intention and do this if you'll keep your Bible bookmark there. And let's go over to Luke chapter 5 and verse 18 for this answer. Examine the intention of the four friends. Where do they want to lay the man? And behold, men brought in a bed a man that was taken with a palsy, and they sought means to bring him in and to lay him. Before him. So what was their intention? They wanted him to be close to Jesus. Because this man needed healing. And so that was their intention. Now let's uh, mark Luke chapter 5. Because we'll be coming back to it. But let's go back to Mark chapter 2. Question number 6. Summarize what the four friends did when they could not get close to Jesus because of the crowd. What did they do? They turned. That's right. And, and look there at verse 4. When they could not come nigh unto him for the press, what's the press? The crowd. They uncovered the roof where he was, and when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. That's um, pretty innovative, but also. That's a lot of work. I suppose that this uh, roof uh, could have been uh, easily repaired if, if they just removed tiles or if they had to remove uh, something back so that they could let them down. We're talking about a pretty good sized hole to let somebody down on a bed. And so uh, this is a pretty big hole. And then think about I, I doubt if they had a uh, rope with them. And so they probably had to make some plans. Let's, let's go get some rope. Because we're going to have to let him down. And they wasn't just have needed one rope. They needed at least four. So that's pretty impressive that they went to that extent to do that. All right. Uh, let's look at uh, question number seven. Examine Jesus. That should be replied. I'm replaying. I made a typographical error. That's not the first one. And I guarantee it won't be the last one. Examine Jesus' reply to the sick person when he saw the faith 
of the four friends. Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Now let me ask you, was it the faith of the sick friend? No. It was the faith of the four friends. Now, you know there seems to always be an agitator. And uh, so let's just notice question number eight. Interpret why certain of the scribes were sitting when most of the crowd was standing. Notice that in verse 6. There were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning their heart. Why would they be seated? I know that's probably a, just a little small bit of information, but when we're studying God's Word, we want to take in everything that is said. If you will, think about what the Lord said in Matthew chapter 23. When he was rebuking the scribes and the Pharisees and he called the hypocrites repeatedly, uh, in Matthew chapter 23 and verse 6, he talked about the uh, hypocrites. He said, They love the uppermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogue. Now, this wasn't the synagogue. But what do you think the common people would have done when, the, when these chief priests come here? They've got that. They, they give them their seats. So isn't it odd that the ones who were complaining were the ones who should have known better? They were religious leaders of the day, and they should have known better. Now, let's, let's talk about uh, those sitting in the house. And to do this, let's go back to Luke 5, and this time verse 17. Luke 5, verse 17. He identifies those sitting in the house. It came to pass on a certain day as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and doctors of the law sitting by, which were come out of every town of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Now, to post that last part, the power of the Lord was present to heal them. I may not read too much of this, but who could the Lord have healed if they were willing? All of them. And them especially. And them especially. Now, what do they need healing of? Sins. Maybe even a bad attitude on God. Hypocrisies. Yep. Self-righteousness. That's right. Now, we've already looked at that verse 6 back in Mark chapter 2. What were they reasoning in their hearts? Look at verse 7 in Mark chapter 2. Who doth this man thus speak blasphemies? Why does this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? If they admit that Jesus can forgive sins, what do they just admit? That he's a God. So they can't, they can't go along with that. So they're denying him. But the truth is he can forgive sins. And he's going to prove that, and then he's going to turn around and tell them that you may know that the Son of Man has power to forgive sins on earth. Now, if Jesus is not the Son of God, they're right. But if he is the Son of God, they're wrong. And we know he is the Son of God. The first question is wrong. The second question was right. That's right. Who can forgive sins but God alone? That part was right. That's right. They just didn't believe Jesus That's right. that person. And, and they accused him basically of blasphemy. That's right. And blasphemy, of course, is speaking against. Right. So, so he's blaspheming and they know what's the penalty for blasphemy. Death. Death. Stone. Stone. Right. And so they're trying to get some, even though he's uh, preaching and healing, instead of praising the Lord and following him, what do they do? They find fault. So, uh, Look 
look at uh, number 11. Well, we've already kind of criticized that question. Two parts. Part of it was wrong, part of it was right. Let's look at question 12. Infer what the scribes had concluded about Jesus and the ability to forgive sins. He couldn't do it. According to them, he could not do it. Now let's look on the back of the shoe. Oh, they didn't say that out loud according to the text. No, they reasoned within themselves. That's right. But Jesus knows their thoughts. That's right. And that's another thing that should have been <laughs> yeah. to them. Yes, that's right. He knows, uh, look at verse, well, let's look at question 13 on the back of the top. And it comes from Mark 2 and verse 8. Indicate what it means that Jesus could perceive in his spirit the reasoning of the scribes. He can understand their thinking. He can understand their thinking. That's exactly right. Now, I just wonder, does he know our thoughts? He, he does. I, I know I've told this so many times. Folks from Hamilton are sick of hearing this, but uh, when I was a youth minister in the national area, uh, I had a secretary that worked uh, for me part time. I worked for the church, but she worked to help me. And uh, one day, we had a pretty big staff, but one day it was just the two of us there, and she came into my office and she was And her name was Ann, and I said, Ann, why are you whispering? We're the only two people in the building. And she said, I don't want God in here. <laughs> don't want God to hear. And then she just busted out the laugh because she knew, I mean, she was old enough to be my mother, but she was a godly woman. And she knew that God could, could hear her whisper. God knew what she was thinking. So Jesus perceived in his spirit the reason of uh, these individuals. And so look at verse 8. Immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reason within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason you these things in your hearts? I wonder. Um, Let's just think about that question that Jesus asked these scribes about the hearts. Now, look at question number 15. Compare the two options that Jesus asked. Which would be easier? Look at these two questions. Number nine. Which is it easier to say to the sick and the false? Thy sins be forgiven thee? Or to say, arise and take up thy bed and walk. Now, just think about those. Let's compare them. What would be required for either of those to work? Divine intervention. Yes. Divine intervention is going to be required. Because if you say, thy sins be forgiven thee, then that means that Jesus is the Son of God, which we know he is. But if he says, Arise and take up thy bed and walk. What has to happen there? The man has polio uh, in, in, in the street. So what has to happen there? He's got to do exactly what he said. He's got to get up and walk. That's right. That's why that was the hardest of the two things to say. Yes. Take up your bed and walk was the hardest of the two things to say because right. it was the only one that demanded physical evidence that it happened. That's right. Because, I mean, when somebody is baptized for remission of their sins and they come up out of the water, we know they're wet. But other than looking soggy, can we really tell a difference? No. But if somebody is sick on the bed and has to be carried and they get up and walk out, uh, something's happened. I had a good uh, friend in, in Tennessee that... Uh, when he was a little boy, he was riding on the back of his daddy's tractor, and uh, he fell off backwards, and the bush hog cut both of his legs off. And it, it was a, a bad experience. But he grew up to be a man, and uh, he had uh, 
artificial eggs or prosthesis and um, but every once in a while they would malfunction. I didn't even know for a long time he didn't have his natural legs. The one day I saw him stand up, I said, do you have back problems? He never had told me. And he said, he told me what happened and he kind of hit on his legs and they were both hollow. And he said, I want to tell you something funny about that. This was back before cell phones. And he said, I was uh, driving through a rough part of town on my way home and said, uh, my car broke down. And so the only telephone was in this bar. And he said, I've never been in there, but he said, I, I didn't have a choice. So he said, I went in there and asked the uh, bartender if I could use the phone, and he said, yeah. There's a pay phone over there. He went over there and called his wife and said, you don't have to send somebody up here. I, my car is taken out. He said about that time, one of those legs broke, just came apart. And he said, I just hit the floor. And he said, that bar was crowded when I walked in. and said, I looked around, there wasn't a soul in there. He <laughs> said, so it had cleared out. And uh, <laughs> he said, the bartender came on back in and said, do I need to call 911 or something? And he said, no, I'm just bring me a screwdriver. <laughs> so he brought him a screwdriver and went out. He said, I, that happened a lot. I knew how to fix it. So I put the leg back on and got my that I walked out there and handed him a screwdriver and said, those one of those men said, I'll never drink again. <laughs>
chief sleep and smell the For the purpose of his miracle was to confirm the word. That's what he's doing. That's right. He's confirming the word. That's exactly right. So, uh, look at question 21 here. Support the amazement of the crowd and why they glorified God when they saw the healed man taking his bed and going before them all. Why were they uh, amazed? They've never seen anything. But they've never seen anything. In fact, they, they go on to say, we never saw it on this fashion. Never seen anything like it. So let's contrast Mark 2 and verse 12, which says, immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw it on this fashion. Now let's look over at Luke 5 and verse 26. And they were all amazed, and they glorified God, and they were filled with fear, saying, we have seen strange things today. Now, um, let, let's go back through this for just a moment. I, I want to uh, identify some different groups here and see what we can learn from them. Um, all these start with the letter H. First, the healer. Who's the healer in this? Jesus. Um, we, we believe he can still heal us from our sins. Because of his blood. And through his word. Through his word. That's exactly right. Now who's the healed? The man who was sick of false. And he got up and took his bed. Not only was he healed, but his sins were forgiven. Now let's let's talk about who the helpers are. Who are the helpers in this story? Those four friends. So we can't be the healer. We can bring people to the healer. Uh, we are the healed if we're children of God. But how can we be helpers? Bring people to Christ. Bring the people to Christ. Bring the people to Christ. Now let's talk about uh, another, and this is a harder group to see. Uh, the hinderers, those that hindered. Who were those? Yeah, the, 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 the crowd around the door. I mean, think about it. They were listening, but were they doing anything to help this person? No. Just crowded around. But look at the hypocrites, the filthy. The hypocrites, we all know who those were. The ones that knew that Jesus could do something about it. But they wouldn't admit it. Now, we, we uh, are going to attend one of those three latter categories. We're either going to help people, hinder people, or be a hypocrite about it. And uh, let's talk for just a moment before we close about the outcome of each of those. Now we know what the outcome of helpers will be. We all have been helped by someone. Someone taught us, probably multiple people taught us. It may have been a parent, it may have been a spouse, it may have been a friend, uh, but somebody helped us know about Jesus. And we need to all make sure that we're helping people to learn about Jesus. Uh, by the way that we live, by the things that we say. But let's talk about those two uh, bad categories. Uh, how can we hinder people from coming to Jesus? Yes, having a bad attitude. Talking negatively about um, the church, elders, <coughs> uh, deacons. You know, uh, I have to admit something. 
even know people didn't like preachers until I became one. <laughs> we weren't allowed to talk about a preacher in our house. Have you ever tasted soap? I don't want to talk about it. But, uh, so we can hinder the progress of Christ and the church. Um, all right, let's, let's talk about how can we be a victory. None of us want to be that. Yes. You know, uh, the concept of a hypocrite comes from a, a mask, a play actor. Uh, one person could be five different characters by just changing the mask. And so, changing a face, pretending to be something that we're not. Um, you did the same thing I did. Some of y'all jumped. <laughs> If we do not practice what we teach, we don't practice what we say. If we say, "Oh, how I love Jesus," but we act like the devil, uh, that's a box. Any comments? I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much agree with what I wanted to say. Any comments? Can, can I add? I want to just make mention of, of, the, of the story in general that we studied tonight. This is the answer to the argument against baptism with regard to the thief on the cross. Yeah. Now, I mean, that thing's been, on, it's been answered a million times, and I still see it every single day. But the question to, or the answer to, well, what about the thief on the cross is answered in this text right here. Jesus had power on earth to forgive sins, and it's exactly what he did. It's exactly what he did in Luke 23. Yeah. You know, it's not it's not like, you know, of course somebody says, well, you can't prove that he wasn't baptized because all of Jerusalem and all of Judea came to John the Baptist and he called Jesus Lord. He knew something about the kingdom. All those things are true. But the answer to the answer to the argument is Jesus had power on earth to forgive sins. Mark 2, Matthew 9, all those passages prove it, Luke 5. And, and that's exactly what he said to the thief in Luke 23. He yes. forgave his sins in person. Well, I appreciate you pointing that out, Brother Todd. And also, somebody told me the other day, I want to be saved by the thief on the cross. I don't believe that's possible. I believe that was a one-time opportunity. And uh, I don't want to be saved that way because I want to be crucified. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to be saved. And then have my legs broken. <laughs> yeah, so that I die. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, thank y'all so very, very much for your uh, participation and for allowing me to. Uh, say a few words. Uh, let's bow the word of prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you will help us to be helpers to bring others to the healer. Help us, Father, to appreciate that we've been healed of our sins. And our Father, I pray that you will help us to search our hearts to make sure that there's no hindrance there and no hypocrisy. And help us to serve you faithfully and loyally all the days of our lives. Thank you, Father, for these beautiful children. Help us to serve you so that we can be by your grace and your mercy and your forgiveness. Give us a life to you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen.
before we do that, uh, first thing is, we have more than we had last night. We had 111 last night. That was our lowest number. So how many do you think we had? That's not more than 111. <laughs> That's how many we had last night. And he was right. Two thousand. Gallagher, preacher count on the part of your son. Two thousand people here tonight. Preacher count. Good job, buddy. All right. How about how about how does one hundred and forty-two sound? One hundred and forty-two. Get. I mean, think we got Brian. That's right. We got Brian. Great guess, buddy. All right, great job. 142. That's a great number. That's our second highest number of the week. And we are so, again, we're so thankful for our brother from Hamilton. Uh, they support this, us all week, especially on Sunday night and tonight. And we cannot thank you enough. And just by way of reminder, on the 31st of July, Burleson will turn out services. And we'll go to Hamilton that night at 6 o'clock for our 1017 reading of the Gospel of Mark. And I sent uh, Teddy and Ryan uh, the uh, chapter assignments for the guys from Hamilton. I guess you guys have started on that. So the 1017 reading at Hamilton on uh, July 31st, starting at 6 o'clock, we will read the Gospel of Mark. Last year we read the Gospel of John, and it was incredible. And so look forward to uh, look forward to reading Mark, uh, reading Mark uh, this coming uh Week. All right. So, my question was, it was the hardest question all week. Who's the greatest superhero in the Bible? Jesus. 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 That's right. Jesus. All right, help me. Give me a name. Give me a name. All right. No. Allie Miller. Allie Miller. Sit on attack. Ah! Sit on attack. Ah! Sit on attack. 
in this state, we thank you for our food. Uh, may we always love and encourage one another. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.